Jim Teresa. So it was a mouthful. Um, let's see. So I'm going to talk about a perfect phylogeny uh, mixture deconvolution problem and how we can apply this uh, problem to cancer sequencing data. So I just quickly want to start by uh, reviewing some of the things we've seen earlier this week. So a tumor uh, is a mixture of uh, heterogeneous uh, cells that have different complements of mutations. And if you were to sequence each of this, uh, these cells individually and also assume that there are no copy number aberrations, then we can represent our input as a matrix, a binary matrix M. The rows of this matrix correspond to individual tumor cells, and the columns correspond to uh, S and Vs. And there are two states. So state 0 corresponds to a non-mutation, the normal state, and state 1 corresponds to a point mutation. And if you make a second assumption about the evolution of this tumor, so if you assume that a point mutation only happens once throughout the entire evolution of a tumor, then this binary matrix admits a perfect phylogeny tree. And we can find this perfect phylogeny tree in linear time following the result by Dan Gosfield. However, most sequencing data is not single cell sequencing. Uh, it's actually obtained using bulk sequencing. And with bulk sequencing, our samples correspond to mixtures of uh, tumor cells in unknown proportions. And in fact, our measurements uh, are variant allele frequencies, uh, which are the fraction of reads that have the variant allele. And we can represent our input again as a matrix. This time, it's not a binary matrix, but it's a matrix uh, with values between 0 and 1. Uh, the rows correspond to samples, so we have three samples here. And the columns correspond to S and Vs, and each entry is the variant allele frequency of that S and V in a specific sample. Now, given the, these variant allele frequencies, we still want to find the tree. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to find out uh, the composition of every sample. So more precisely, we want to know uh, the proportion of the clones that occur in a sample. And this is, the, um, this is basically a two-state perfect phylogeny mixture deconvolution problem. It's been studied extensively. Uh, we've seen a lot of talk this, week's, uh, this week. And in our recent ISMB paper, um, we basically took a step back and we looked at the underlying combinatorial problem by assuming error-free data. And we've shown that this problem, that the decision problem is NP-complete. So in our work, we assume that there are no copy number aberrations. And today, I want to talk about copy number aberrations. So one way of dealing with copy number aberrations is by trying to move everything into state 1, the mutated state. So what you could do is you could try to rescale your variant allele frequencies such that they correspond to the fraction of tumor cells that have a mutation. And one way of doing this is by looking at purity and ploidy. And in fact, this has been done a lot. Um, However, if you want to model copy number aberrations as events in your tree, then you have to consider more than two states in your tree. So you have to look at a multi-state phylogeny model. And that's going to be the topic of this talk. So what I will do is I will give you a formal problem statement that captures this problem. I will show you what solutions of this problem look like. And I will briefly touch uh, upon how we apply this, uh, this model to infer uh, a phylogenetic tree that uh, model the interplay between SMVs and CMVs. So let's start with the problem statement. So I will introduce this by basically having an analog between the two-state case and the multi-state case. So in the two-state case, so this was our ICMB work, um, as input we're given this frequency matrix. And what we want to do is, like I said, we want to infer a perfect phylogeny tree. And we also want to infer mixing proportions. So this perfect phylogeny tree can be modeled by a binary matrix. And the mixing proportions that I have over here, so for instance, if you look at a third sample, and let's look at the red mutation, so that corresponds to the third sample over here, so that's the third column. It's, it has a frequency of 0.6, and that's simply the sum of these two uh, proportions. So what we want to do is, given this frequency matrix, we want to find the tree and mixing proportions such that they are compatible with our observed uh, input measurements. And the mixing proportions can be captured by a matrix that we call the usage matrix. And the entries have to be non-negative, and they have to sum up to at most one. So one way of looking at this problem is basically 
looking at it as a matrix factorization problem. So we're given this frequency matrix, and we want to factorize it into two matrices, a perfect phylogeny matrix and a usage matrix. And, well, that's basically what I've shown over here. So that's the variant allele frequency factorization problem. Now let's look at a multi-state case. So in a multi-state case, the infinite sites assumption that we've made over here translates to the infinite alleles assumption. And basically, a character can have more than one state. In fact, the character has k states. Uh, state zero is the initial state, so that's the same thing. And you're only allowed to change to the same state once. So that's the multi-state case. And to, to make a contrast, instead of having one matrix as input, we have a frequency tensor as input. So, we have what, so basically, we have an additional dimension, which corresponds to the states. And if we take slices of this frequency tensor, we basically get three matrices over here, corresponding to the three states. Columns correspond to characters, and rows correspond to samples. And the goal is to find this multi-state perfect phylogeny tree. So that's still the same thing. We want to find a perfect phylogeny tree. And we can capture this tree as three separate binary matrices. And in fact, what we want to do is we want to find a usage matrix. And this usage matrix has to be applied to every frequency slice. So instead of solving one matrix factorization problem, we have to solve k uh, matrix uh, factorization problems where the matrix u is shared across all slices. So this is the perfect phylogeny mixture deconvolution problem. And this is a paper that's going to be uh, presented at, at uh, Recom this year. I really don't understand what k states uh, correspond to in terms of events. Yeah. I will come back to that later, but just to let me just quickly go back to my introduction. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to capture uh, copy number aberrations as separate states. So, they, so basically this, the, the k states will uh, encode different combinations of uh, maternal copies, paternal copies, and the number of mutations that you have. So it's not the copy number, right? It's, it's, it's the interaction of a copy number aberration and an SMV. So you look at one specific locus, and you want to know how many maternal copies you have, how many paternal copies you have, and how many of those copies have the SMV. But I will come to that later. How many? It's not where the SMVs occur. You're not going uh, distinguishing one copy from the other. You're just counting. That's it, per state. I'm not. F uh, Maybe I'll. I'll yes, let's, let's, let's see if we can actually uh, talk about it later. So. So now let me, let me tell you what solutions of this problem look like. So again, I will go back to the two-state case. And in the two-state case, we have the infinite size assumption. And because of the infinite size assumption, uh, a character changes state only once, meaning that once you get a mutation, you will keep having that mutation. So there's no back mutations. And now something really cool happens. So if you look at this uh, tree over here, so in this node, uh, mutation 1 for character C was introduced. So that's the first time it happened. And because of this infinite size assumption, everything in the subtree rooted at this node will have state 1 for character C. And what you in fact have is that the subtree of the vertices that have state 1 for character C is the same as the subtree rooted at the vertex that first introduced state 1 for character C. So that's a crucial observation. So these two subtrees are the same. And what you, could, what you in fact could do is you could actually think about your frequencies as a mass of a subtree rooted at this vertex. So the frequency of character C with state 1 is simply the sum of the usages of all the vertices in that subtree. So if you want to have the usage of this single node, you could simply uh, take the frequency of this entire subtree, the blue one, and subtract the green frequency and the orange frequency. And like I said, this has to be non-negative. And this corresponds to the sum condition. And this is a necessary and sufficient condition to solutions of the problem. Now let's go to the multi-state case. So here we have the infinite alleles assumption. So we have more than one state. And now something uh, different happens. So if I look at, um, at the same character, so state 1 for character C, so the subtree rooted at this vertex contains three vertices. But here, uh, this 
this vertex over here, we introduce a new stage for character C. So the subtree rooted at this vertex has three vertices, and a subtree where character C has state one just has two vertices. So that's, that's basically different. So we no longer capture the mass or the sum of the usages of the subtree rooted at the vertex. And if we want to do that, we have to look at the descendant sets. So if I look at this vertex over here, I see that I have a descendant uh, state two. And by incorporating those, I can still arrive uh, at the subtree rooted at this vertex as the disjoint union of, in this case, the, uh, the yellow and the purple uh, uh, subtree. So by doing this, I can apply the same trick to basically obtain a condition on having non-negative usages by requiring that a cumulative frequency, and this cumulative frequency is defined using the descendant sets, is at least the sum of the cumulative frequencies of the children. So that's the multi-state sum condition. It's a generalization. And to see why this is a generalization, you could think about the k equals 2 case. In the k equals 2 case, every descendant set is a singleton. It has only state 1. So basically, this equation becomes the same as this equation. OK, so how do we find uh, solutions that satisfy the sum condition? So in a two-state case, um, one way of doing this is by basically defining a graph, a simple directed graph, where the vertices correspond to uh, mutations, or SMVs. And there is a match between two uh, mutations if the frequency of the parent is at least the frequency of the child. And then what you want to find are spanning trees in this graph that satisfy the sum condition that I just spoke about. And that's, in fact, all that you need to do. And finding such a constrained spanning tree, uh, tree is, um, yeah, is, well, deciding whether such a tree exists is NP-complete. And in our ISMB work, we've shown in our reduction that, well, we've given a reduction that where the number of samples is linear in the number of characters. Now let's go to the multi-state case. So here the situation is more complicated. So instead of a simple graph, we have a multi-graph with multi-edges. Uh, the nodes correspond to character state pairs. And the edges, the multi-edges, are labeled by valid descendant set pairs. So we have to keep track of descendant sets, which we don't know a priori. So we look at all possible descendant sets. And we only uh, look at valid descendant set pairs. And in fact, we still want to do the same thing. So we want, we want to find a spanning tree that satisfies this generalized sum condition, the multi-state sum condition. And in our new work, we strengthened this result. So we've basically shown that the, the problem is NP-complete for uh, two states. So that's the same as here. But the number of samples is just two. So it's not uh, fixed parameter detectable in the number of samples, which is actually a useful parameter to have. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So how do we apply this to cancer sequencing? So let me see if I can answer your question now. Um, so our input are read depth ratios, BLE frequencies, and variant allele frequencies. And the characters that we want to have correspond to SMVs. So we look at SMVs. And for every SMV, uh, we model the state as a triple, x, y, z. x is the number of maternal copies, y is the number of paternal copies, and z is the number of uh, mutations that you have for that locus. So the normal state corresponds to 110. And what we do also is we assume cladistic characters. So we assume that we know uh, the ordering of the states. Uh, so basically, we assume that we have an ordering of the states. And then given uh, a state tree, basically, we fix the order of the state. And then we try to infer whether a character, the variant allele frequency that we observe, and the read ratios and the BLE frequencies are compatible um, with one another. We enumerate all such possibilities. And by doing so, we can infer uh, phylogenetic trees uh, where we uh, capture the interplay between SMVs and CMV. So we basically try to do that simultaneously. So over here, uh, we have a SMV uh, on, on this gene where that first underwent a single copy deletion, and then it gained a mutation. So to conclude, I've shown you how the infinite sites model for SMVs can be generalized uh, to the infinite alleles model for SMVs and CNAs. I've introduced the perfect phylogeny mixture deconvolution problem. 
I've briefly shown you what solutions of this problem look like. I've said something about the hardness. And I've shown you how this can be applied to cancer sequencing data. And there are more applications to this problem. So this is really a perfect philosophy mixture deconvolution problem. So with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, Ben, my advisor, and uh, my co-authors, Greta and Leila, and the rest of the Rafael research group. And I skipped over a lot of details, but there will be a preprint available soon on the archive. Thanks. So the bottom line in every single copy number uh, model mm -hmm. is you cannot distinguish a clone which is low frequency with high copy number versus uh, a clone with uh, uh, low copy number and a uh, high, high frequency. So um, you must have an upper bound. You must have some kind of an assumption to favor one. Yes. So... Okay, let me give you a little bit more detail. So what I assume as input are basically, I, so, so first you need to run a copy number caller, and for every S and V, it's gonna tell you what the copy number state is, and it's actually gonna be phased into X and Y, and it will tell you the proportions of those. So that's the input that we take. And then, uh, you really wanna have a... How could you assume that? Anyway, we'll talk. Well, you need to start somewhere. And then, we basically... Once you know it, it's obvious. Well, there's still a lot of combinations, and this is where multiple states help, uh, multiple samples help a lot, because then you can rule out certain combinations, and that's what we see happening in our uh, experiments on real data. So, uh, how do you handle errors? I suppose you have errors. Right? Yeah, great question. So I skipped over that completely. Um, so what we do is um, we basically generalized um, our input instead of a of being a point for a character in a sample in a specific state, we basically have a confidence interval. And then the problem is to find a, a, a spanning tree, and at the same time, we also solve a flow problem. We want to assign frequencies within the respective intervals such that you satisfy the multi-state sum condition. So that's how we try to capture uh, errors. Yeah. Last question from Russell. I actually had the same question. Okay. okay. So let's thank the speaker. Okay. Uh, uh, Thank you.